Thank you everyone in the classroom once again for welcoming me here. And uh, today I would like to talk about game mechanics. And um, this is uh, my index for today. I want to just start off just to recap on what I mentioned in my previous course. Uh, we know as a fact that this the games industry is the fastest growing industry today. And we learned that uh, the drive of this fast growing uh, in game industry is because games are so powerful. And uh, I think our main theme here in our class is how do we utilize this power of games and game mechanics into good use. And uh, today I will present to you three stories, which touches on three principles of gaming, which is the meaning, mastery, and autonomy. And under these three principles, there are several mechanics that you would like to probably understand before you start uh, designing your own intervention uh, package. And in the end, uh, I'll touch on the implications and new trends in uh, game mechanics. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, first of all, once again, just to recap, uh, digital games uh, industry has overtook the movie industry in the year 2015. And it's by far the fastest growing industry today. And we see two uh, aspects uh, that drives this uh, trend. One is people are more digital natives our audience are digital natives, as well as smartphones and tablets are really coming into the market. So the touch points where the games can be applied, there are numerous multi-channels that are present today. Now, so why is it that games are so powerful? Um, this is a well uh, illustrated picture by Mr. Toledad Toledano, it's called the Gamers. So this is a picture taken uh, while these people are playing games. Mm -hmm. And as you look at uh, expressions, it's so strong and powerful. We call this game emotions. And um, so how do we use this power into uh, a good use? And Maybe uh, some of you know Jane McGonigal. She's very famous in this industry. She has been a game designer. And uh, there's a famous TED talk that she uh, presented. It's called Gaming Can Make a Better World. And I think you re recall um, in my previous uh, lesson, the class, I mentioned that uh, within like seven, eight years, same publisher, Game damages your brain. Now today, game mechanics solve everything, right? So <laughs> there's, a, there's a big trend change here. So she mentions, I just want to touch on one uh, very uh, important quote that she made uh, in her, her uh, TED presentation. In uh, her presentation, she, she quoted, in the best designed games, our human experience is optimized. And this is a very uh, good quote that we would uh, draw in later because in an optimized environment, people are more motivated and have an environment more optimized. The balance between the meaning, mastery, and autonomy has to be optimized as well. So this is a very good uh, quote I think she made. So. Uh, again, in her uh, speech, she showed this picture and illustrated this as an epic win. What is an epic win? So, um, epic win uh, is actually when uh, the gamer, who's on the verge of something called an epic win, is like just, just instants before he's able to clear the level or understand something. 
So you can see the anxiety there. And he knows he's just about the tipping point of making that or clearing that level. So these are very, very strong and positive emotion that uh, game mechanics under optimal condition can retrieve from a person. And we want to best use uh, this uh, mechanics to drive people's behavior change. Now, but the big question is, how can we take feelings from or power of games and apply them to real uh, world to work? And as you know, by and large, games, when I say games, both casual and core games, are played for entertainment, pure entertainment. And uh, rather than learning or intellectual and behavioral challenge, and it might not be true for everyone, but I would say mostly it is the case. So what are the elements and mechanics of games that grab our attention, keep us motivated and engaged? And what are important elements and mechanics of games for behavior change? So these are the main topics today. So <clears throat> in my index, I think I, I said that I will present three stories that are aligned to the elements of games and game mechanics. Um, on the top part, you, you see a child walking. Let's, let's say um, this picture illustrates you walking from school to your home. And let's say it's like 30 minutes walk or, or even an hour work, uh, walk. It's, uh, it's a very tedious task you have to go through. But uh, when you are a child, sometimes you start imagining. Let's just step on the bricks. If, it, if the road is paved in bricks, then let's step on the bricks that are colored black or dark. You know? Then you start thinking, hey, this is more of a dramatic adventure, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a Mer Mario uh, Brothers game. And um, basically, you have to step on certain bricks to clear this level. And also, another star uh, story. You were asked from a parent to wipe your floor. And this is also very daunting, right? But with certain reward, then it could be an exciting time trial, right? Third, ex uh, third story, let's say you're playing in a, in a sandbox with your friends. And uh, with uh, Kaze no Tani Naoshika, this is a very famous Japanese cartoon. Um, mommy is not watching, so Let's create something that is, you know, like, you get to play freely, right? So it's just, I just want to mention that uh, we were all once the game creators. We didn't realize what is behind it, or we didn't realize what the mechanics was. But today, we will go and define what these story, as a terminology, can be replaced to as a game mechanics. So what can we learn from uh, given three stories is one uh, about a walk going home is a make believe rules and challenges. So make believe and rules and challenges mean having a make believe story wrapped around an experience like you have to step on a dark stone or you're out, right? And adding rules and challenges, you know, the rules is to step on the back stone, make it more interesting. It's about the story and the meaning. And also, if you have a goal, instant feedback with a reward, then it's a good uh, game mechanics put into use. And also, free, safe play space and share toy objects it gives uh, freedom to play 
It's more of a sandbox type of play. So here is the three main elements of games. You can say three principles of games. So make belief, rules, and challenges are related to meaning. When I say meaning, how do we make experience and activity connected to the user in a meaningful fashion? And I will explain further in my later uh, PowerPoint, but make belief, rules, challenges, makes meanings. And also, if you set a goals and instant feedback with a reward, it's more related to mastery. You need to clear something, you need to learn from doing, and clear again. So this is mastery. And finally, uh, not to uh, forget the autonomy, it's a, it's a sense of freedom. And uh, autonomy is something that you are willing to do. It's not like a work that you have to do. When you say autonomy, it's something that you are willing to do. And this is a very, very important driver as well. So, uh, principle of game, meaning. So how does video game achieve kind of meaning to the activity? This is another illustration taken from Mario Kart. So objective is to save a princess, Peach Princess. She was abducted by this uh, Koopa. And your goal is to save her. That's a simple goal. But there is a story here which you can devote your feeding into. Another illustration or example. This is a, a very old game uh, on a, an Atari game. Atari was one of the first uh, consumer-based game platform that came out. Um, and this was one of the uh, best-selling game on Atari platform called the Missile Command. If you just exclude the story from this game, what you are basically doing here is you have to avoid that red dot coming down and hitting you at the blue point. To avoid that happen, you have to use that blue dot and hit that red one to avoid. When I say this, this is not interesting, right? Because there's no story to it. It, it just describes what you have to do. But it gets engaging if there is a story. And miss a command here with this picture, then you would understand that you have to defend your cities from nuclear bombs. And you're the operator who shoots the intervention missile. Then it, it gets more engaging, right? You understand the object better and you're more motivated. And also, a second issue about the mastery. Mastery is not just about giving rewards or badges. You know, there is a goal, there's a feedback, and there's a reward. But it's not just earning rewards, because just earning rewards, is it engaging? And this is a very interesting example. Uh, on the left hand, er, do everyone know about the Skinner box? Um, okay, what uh, the mouse here is doing is that he knows when he touches on a lever, the sugar pellet comes out. And you know, mouse loves the sugar pellet. So he keeps on hitting it. So the sugar pellet is a reward. But let's, let's assume that there's a goal and there's an instant feedback and you get a reward for that is the game mechanics. 
there's a good uh, experiment uh, called Progress Wars. And it was uh, a game done by Jacob Skirting. And it, it, you, you just have to tap on the red bar and keep on tapping. And the bar just extends. And that's the reward. So the goal is to make that a bar full. And what you have to do is press on that red uh, button and the reward is a full bar. But this is not engaging, right, at all. So what makes it very engaging is this. So why is it that video games are very rewarding? Yes, we do use these mechanics, but this right example is a good example that this isn't about fun. <laughs> so we need to define in video games what is fun. So fun is just another word for learning. Fun from games arises out of mastery. It arises out of comprehension. It is the act of solving puzzles that makes games fun. With games, learning is the drug. Here, there's no learning. And after, let's say, there might be one learning, but after you learn that, what's next? It's a tedious, repeated action over and over and over. And you know what to expect. There's no learning. So this is what we need to have in mind when we design games. And when we use game mechanics, we want to motivate our uh, intervention audiences. A game. Mastery, there's a tension. Will I make it? And if there's a big gap between the tension and the final resolution, that's when people get hooked. But one thing that we have to keep in mind here again is that how about this? Remember? We need to learn from something. How about this? School challenges us with mathematical equations. And all of you are challenged every day, I think. But sometimes, I won't say not all, but it's not fun, right? Mm -hmm. Then same kind of equation we may use for Magic the Gathering. It's a card game, but you have to calculate to win. But this calculation, it's the same calculation, but not tiresome, it's interesting. Why is that? It's part of learning, right? Both. But maybe we feel more fun from Magic Gathering. Because I want to just add another important aspect to this term of fun. Under optimal conditions. Fun is just another word for learning under optimal conditions. I know you are students of Kyoto University. Many of you might think equation is fun. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. I'm getting the right responses. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay? So, because it's not under optimal condition. Okay? When you're playing and when you're having fun, that is a proof that it's under an optimal condition to you. So how do we design an optimal condition? 
this is a very important part. So under optimal conditions, first, we need to have a challenge and it needs to be interesting. Let's say this is a golf, right? There's a goal and there's a rule. And the goal is just to put this little ball into this hole. And it's not interesting. Remember the Skinner box? The goal is, uh, uh, let's say, um, not Skinner box, this is better, progress wars. The goal is to have the bar full. The challenge, you need to press it. So you need to have a rule to make things more engaging. In golf, the goal is to put this little ball into the little hole. But if you put a rule saying you have to use a golf club and you must start from a certain point and you have to start from wherever the ball ends up. So this creates interesting challenges. And these challenges need to be interesting with clear visually presented goals, well-structured flow of goals, scaffolded challenges makes games interesting. And when I say scaffolded challenges, the tension between, uh, I won't say tension, balance between the difficulty and the time and skill needed to gain that or clear that difficulty has to be optimal. So this is uh, a graph that illustrates that, is that under optimal game flow, it's not too easy, but also it's not too hard to you. So when you start playing the game, the difficulty goes up, but the time needed to clear that difficulty is also balanced out. So you don't get bored or you don't get, or you, you, you just throw it away, right? No, I, I, I'm, never go, I'm never gonna clear this game. So it has to be very optimal. And also, under optimal conditions, varied pacing provided, uh, sorry, varied pacing provides failures to learn from and valuing the sense of accomplishment when you finally achieve it. So success feels more and more rewarding compared to the number of failures attempts. So you wanna make things not too easy, but not too hard, but also at the same time, pacing needs to be more uh, varied, not just in quantity, but in variety. When I say variety, uh, quality, depth, and complexity, these are the things that makes pacing more um, uni not unified. If the pace is unified, people start to get boarding, bored. But sometimes the challenges is a little uh, challenging than the normal pacing, then it gives a rhythm to the whole process. And also, uh, excessive positive feedback is very important in giving an optimal conditions. More the difficulty, more the excessive positive feedback is needed because you need to refuel his motivation to challenge the next stage. So these are the things that uh, you have to keep in mind when you design your game and intervention package to be very effective. I think I mentioned about the ghost of Mario Kart. 
so I, I put, added another slide. So Mario Kart has a ghost function in a time trial mode. Let's say you are a beginner using this Mario Kart game. Eventually, you get to play with your friends. But in the early stages, you would probably want to practice. So what Mario Kart did was you see a ghost. That is the fastest lap you have earned in this game. So you can compete with your best lap and learn from doing. This is one way of approach of giving an optimal condition because it's you who have done the best lap, meaning that you can easily, I won't say easily, but it's easier to overachieve what you have done. And by giving a ghost, you'll see where you made a mistake, where you did good. So it gives a good feedback, not just a feedback, but good feedback. But also there are some areas that you have to be careful about when designing this intervention package. And this is a good example. Nintendo has developed a pedometer called a personal trainer walking. So if you have this pedometer with you every day, it captures how much you walked. And you can compete with people who have bought this uh, game and is playing. So every day, in the end of the day, you can hook up your pedometer to a game and say, so did I do good compared to other people who are using this game? And that's initially put into this game to motivate you because you want to compare and you want to compete. And also you feel the sense that you're not alone. There are other people who are doing the same thing. But that's a good mechanics, right? Game mechanics there. But someone in the next day, in a Twitter <laughs> or wherever, <laughs> releases this picture, right? Then you understand, wait a minute. Was I competing with a dog or like, you know, it demotivates you, right? So when you design a game, you want to kind of avoid people who can hack it or cheat on that. And another good example, you know Pokemon Go, right? What if <laughs> you see these people, <laughs> right? <laughs> these are people on a Segway, right? <laughs> Saying, yeah, that's not fair, right? That's not fair. You know, good mechanics are... Uh, oh, and by the way, the right-hand picture is Pokemon Go on a drone. <laughs> so you're not walking, you know? You know, drone's just going around and around. <laughs> yeah, so there's a game mechanic there under an optimal condition, but you have to have a system, or it's better to have a system where people can't cheat or hack. And this is, this is very important. So what we do, this is a picture of uh, a place that we, we, did a, uh, we did a pilot testing. What we do is to, to design a game and see whether it's designed in an optimal condition, we do a lot of pilot testing and monitor testing. And this is a picture of 
our title, when we prepared our software to be released in Europe. It was originally um, about for Japanese uh, environment, but uh, same content, but different audience. You need to localize, culturalize, optimal conditions might have a uh, high dependency to culturalization and localization. So these are the things that we do carefully. And uh, that's a mirror there. So people who are doing a monitoring uh, test cannot see us seeing them. And also we set up a camera to see where actually the audience is hitting or pressing the button. And uh, with these reports, we change and configure the difficulty sometimes, and even sometimes uh, the level, and make it more optimized. Optimized means it gives a more hook, stronger hook to the audience. Another uh, important element, uh, autonomy. This is very important. And this is a famous story from Tom Sawyer. Um, Tom Sawyer, uh, in his story, he's, he's asked to paint the wall white. And it, it's something that he didn't want to do, right? So what he did was he pretended that painting a white wall is very fun. Why? Because he knew his friends going to walk by and say, what are you doing? Right? If he was painting the wall, very sadly, probably friends will say, hey, what happened? Your parents said you had to do this. But he wanted to persuade his friends to take over his job, willingly take over his job. So he started painting it white and said, hey, this is so fun, right? So eventually his friends come over and say, what are you doing? This is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun. This is, this is great. And friends say, really? I want to do that. He said, no, 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 you can't do that. I want to do this myself. This is fun. And eventually friends were so persuaded that they started saying, I will pay you to replace you. <laughs> so not only he gained a money, but he was able to replace uh, his friend to do his job in the end. And what this describes is that in autonomy, it has to be a willingness there. You're willing to do things. And uh, so work, means consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, but under optimal condition, it has to be a play where you are willing to do that. So again, if you want to design a game, and have people willingly play it, these are the things that you need to be um, careful. Autonomy can be easily damaged if you slipped extrinsic reward on an activity. When you say you are willing to do something, it needs to be intrinsic. But if you over over put in an extrinsic reward, it demotivates you. So in the end, it curves the autonomy through control and devaluing the activity itself. So you, you would want to put in a reward after a certain task, but you don't want to have that reward as an extrinsic reward. You want to disguise it as an intrinsic reward. How do you disguise it? It might differ on your audience, but the more the reward is intrinsic, 
the more user is motivated and the more user or the high, higher the probability of user clearing the whole process. So this is a very important part related to autonomy. And so a little tip on how to avoid this uh, damage is one, try not to put strings attached as an extrinsic reward. Or even if you have an extrinsic reward strings attached, but you want to disguise it very carefully so that people do not think it's an extrinsic reward. And also, uh, shared goals and individual pursuit is another uh, a great way to, uh, to avoid this damage because there are friends there. You want to quit, but there's friends there. But also, you don't want this to happen, right? You don't want to understand that or know or realize that your friend was a dog, right? So this is where cheating, avoiding cheating comes in. And also, informational and helpful feedback rather than controlling feedbacks. When you do challenge, and there's a goal, and there's a rule, and there's an instant feedback, you don't want to say, hey, you didn't make it because you didn't do this and this and this, right? Play comes from solving puzzles. So you don't want to give them a direct feedback. You want to guide your audience to better understand what the, what the next move is. Great example. It's not saying you did not turn left in a 60 degrees diagonal here. That's why you didn't make the best rap. <laughs> You're learning from doing and learning from your past. This is a helpful feedback where there is still a room for an audience to solve the puzzle in a higher probability. And also, when rewards become expected, this is also boring. Remember the Skinner box? I don't know about the mouse. I'm not the mouse, but uh, if he, maybe he might understand just pressing sugar pellets every time. It might bore him. But sometimes you get a chocolate or whatever the difference, <laughs> then you're motivated to play more, right? Because you understand hey, there's an excitement, what's coming next, right? So, it starts. so anyhow, uh, I don't know whether it's true for a mouse, but it's true for a human. So, unexpected rewards. So, but this is the implications that I want to uh, uh, give to you. One is that the game elements provide a solid foundation for thinking about gamification, serious games, beyond just adding a superficial points and badges. They offer an opportunity to embed behavior change into the game experience. And uh, so please become a good user of game principles for better user experience and contribute to behavior change. So this is my implication for today. And in the end, uh, if you're interested, uh, there are several new trends. I know in my last uh, class, there were uh, questions about uh, new trends that may, um, that may influence uh, serious games and uh, games gamification approach in behavior change is one is called captology. 
it's it's more on the technology side. It's how to persuade people to change. So from a technological point, so per se, it's, sometimes it's called the persuasive technology. For example, um, VR, virtual reality. How does this apply to behavior change? And also big data analysis. This is very important because our audience, like I said in the beginning, are more and more using, or uh, I would say using games on an online environment, meaning that data can be retrieved and easily configure your game so it's more personal, adaptive to your audience meaning creating an optimal condition to a person. And also, uh, psychological well-being aspect is very important. Uh, for example, one is called the PERMA model. PERMA stands for positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And FOG behavior model, but BJ Fogg is another uh, very important, uh, I would say, an element that might uh, influence gamification in a very positive way. So what Fogg behavior model illustrates here is that um, if you have low motivation, let's say it's uh, in a Tom Sawyer story, it's a work. It's not intrinsic. Then you don't want to design it in a hard way, right? You want to make it easy. Or people will fail. But if you're highly motivated, then you can start from a higher difficulty. But still, people will do that. So a uh, psychological aspect and these models will probably have a positive synergy with the gamification approach. Because basically, game designers are doing that. And by a pilot testing, a lot of numer numerous pilot testing, they're trying to achieve the optimal condition in behavior. And also, social relationships is very important because in old days, game, most of the games were standalone. You were not able to interact. But with online gaming technology, with big data analysis, more personalized, adaptive, in terms of not being adaptive and personalized in only one audience, but in social audience as well. So this is a very uh, important element uh, of trend that may uh, affect gamification and serious gaming in the near future. So thank you and uh, that's it.